Okay. Last of the day. We'll try to get done and then uh, everybody can sit on I-75 as they're heading home. So the, the question about safety, uh, this, is, this is a discussion about heroes. Um, simply put, there's some things in our past that should have remarkable influence on the way we perceive what we do. And frequently, we forget about our heroes, and we forget about the story that, that they can tell. So today's the last uh, talk is going to be a little bit more storytelling uh, than it will be a review of a lot of data and, and meta-analysis. So you know my disclosures. I work on a lot of inventions and therefore have to think about the safety of those things. And what we're going to try to do is remind us of our past and re review some of the basic foundations of safety, which is so vitally important in obstetrics, and to look at some kind of systematic approach to safety and its evaluation, and then apply that to my favorite intervention, which is progestogens for the prevention of preterm birth. So simply put, the modern era of medicine, how we approach scientifically what we do and all the other discussions that we've had today is, is fundamentally changed because of this circumstance. Having obstetricians and, and care providers provide thalidomide early in pregnancy resulted in a malformation sequence that was relatively common in the late 50s and 60s that resulted in micromelia and a variety of long-term complications for trying to treat and prevent complications in early pregnancy. And it was a terrible, tragic lesson. And it drove dramatic changes in how our government and how our science and how medical care takes place. And so the first hero that I want to talk about is the person that minimized the effect of the exposure of this drug in the United States. Unlike Europe, unlike Canada, <clears throat> this individual who was relatively new to her job at the FDA got an application from a drug company and said, no, you're not going to market that drug in the United States. And so she, relatively early, back in the early 1960s, she took on the drug company, what used to be that you just made your application for marketing of your drug in the United States, and if the FDA didn't act on it within six months, it was automatically approved. She stood up to the drug company and said, no, you're not going to be approved for this indication even if they are using it in Europe and even if they are using it in other locations. Her name was Frances Kelsey. She's the only woman that's in this picture in the Oval Office when uh, President Kennedy signed this landmark legislation to change the course of medicine. And in 1962, she's got to be one of the only two or three, five, ten women in this country that had both her MD and her PhD, and hers happened to be in pharmacology. Very intelligent. She's the second woman to receive the President's Award for Distinguished Federal uh, federal civilian service. She worked for many, many years, ultimately ended up directing the FDA's evaluation of drugs. But her inspirational story of standing up and not doing the drug approval led to President Kennedy signing landmark legislation. Now, the individual that's right here happens to be Estes Kefauver. And Estes is from the grand city of Nashville, Tennessee. So you also, as Tennesseans, can, even though credit needs to be given where credit is due, Estes Kefauver created the Kefauver-Harris Amendments, which said, in effect, that in order for drugs to get approved, you have to do, have reproducible evidence that says this stuff works. 
Dr. Lewis's concern about do we have big enough trials and do they, those big trials repeatedly demonstrate the benefit. That kind of evidence is what I showed you in the first talk of mine, is the kind of efficacy discussions that we need to be confident that what we're doing actually is improving outcomes. They had to go back in the 60s and review every single drug that had previously been, administered, been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Imagine if we had to go back and look at every single drug that was being utilized. They had to do it and they ultimately found out that one third of the drugs that were being used in the United States didn't, didn't have sufficient evidence to say that they should be used anymore. They got tossed off the market. So it changed the way that we generate evidence, and the way that we look at evidence, and when Dr. Lewis gets worried about why are we making decisions based upon insufficient evidence, it's trying to harken back to some of these kinds of concerns that, uh, that go back to, for us to say, how do we know something works? How is the grade good enough? So the FDA is these new standards on reproducibility and generalizability that have been in, in service for about the last five decades, and they've, they've done actually relatively well for us. There, um, there however, persists to be some, some difficulties that we have. So the second great lesson in obstetrics and the history of medications and, and widespread use of medications is the use of, of DES to try to prevent stillbirth. And when this hormone, this estrogen, was given relatively early in pregnancy, it took years for us to figure out that exposure of, to this compound in pregnancy resulted in the development of clear cell adenocarcinomas in teenagers and women in their 20s. This is 20 years later after they're, they're getting exposed to this medication in utero that there are going to be women that are dying from that intervention. There's going to be women that have abnormally shaped uteruses, a T-shaped uterus instead of the usual. They're going to have increases in pregnancy loss, preterm birth as a result of this complication. So not just affecting this generation, but next generation, and that took decades to figure out. Safety is, takes a while to appreciate and understand. So we have therapies in obstetrics that we know <coughs> that, that what we're treating, by and large, is not a disease process. Human reproduction is not a disease and we need to choose very wisely and very carefully who we are going to treat. Prophylactically giving lots of people an exposure to any medication is always fraught with the potential for greater danger. Waiting too long means it's always difficult for you to change the outcome. We must be compelled, especially when there's op opportunities to use different interventions to use the safest intervention and we have to use and we have to maintain pharmacovigilance we have the unique opportunity and privilege to treat pregnant women but some of the consequences of our actions may take decades to evolve so in the application of those constructs to to progestogen treatment we would want to know that and understand that some of our safety concerns may be identified later after drugs are widely used, that, that the safety of these drugs may be different. Each individual drug in a particular class of medications can have its unique effects. And we should evaluate those individual drugs as well as combinations of drugs to try to look for some of these adverse outcomes. Now we talked a little bit this morning about what progesterone is trying to accomplish in stimulating receptors and having it change how the cervix works and the myometrium and the membrane weakness and, and, and its effects on the decidua. And you can look that progesterone improves 
many of the attributes that we want to happen for pregnancy to be prolonged and to be maintained. And you can give drugs. The abortion pill is what people have labeled it, but it's called RU486 or mifeprostone. And you can look, when you give an antagonist to progesterone, you can see a variety of bad things that can happen. Changes in each one of those tissues that can result from blocking progesterone's actions. So we need to ask ourselves, this artificial, this synthetic drug, this drug that I showed you this morning is not ever converted into progesterone. How is it acting on those receptors that we think are most influential in this process? And we need to make, the, we need to make sure that we know that this drug is not this drug. 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproweight is not progesterone. They are two different compounds in the same class. We want to look at some of the pharmacology and the influence of those individual drugs, look at what, how long they're around. Some of those, how are we going to administer these drugs and what does that mean for both their efficacy and safety? Is there any issues for dose response? And, and lastly, what populations are we treating? And we'll go through some of those fundamentals of how pharmacodynamics can influence safety. But we, we can boil it down, and we know that one's a vaginal preparation, and one we give a shot to. That's simple to know. This drug will get absorbed from the vagina, get to the cervix, get to the uterus and the membranes, and won't have as much systemic influence, whereas this drug is going to be injected and is first going to be disseminated through the system and then ultimately reach the target of origin in the reproductive tract. And I told you, this drug does not get cleaved and turn into this one. The half-life, 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate stays around half-life is about 16 minutes, and progesterone not too long in the serum, rapidly cleared by the, by the um, liver, as we talked about this morning. So we need to know if we're going to be looking for some of these biomarkers earlier in pregnancy. Just remember, you must have a high margin of safety with this intervention because you're going to be treating women with this drug for months. This is a prolonged exposure to be talking about giving this medication to a developing fetus over such a prolonged interval of time. So safety is even more paramount. Now, many of us are familiar with this kind of a diagram when we take our medical school education and we talk about embryology and we say what's developing and at this particular time because when we think about exposure to medications we typically think about the micromelia uh, thalidomide story we think about teratogenicity and its effect on individual organ systems what is it doing to how a heart develops or how limbs are growing or what's it doing um, to the GI tract and we know that those exposures are incredibly important to affect these individual organ systems development less than approximately 10 weeks of pregnancy. So if you are going to be giving someone a drug or a medication that's starting at between 16 and 20 weeks, you've got to be thinking about what's growing and developing in that interval. And the thing that's mostly growing is the brain. It's very difficult for us to figure out how brains are put together. We're not that smart. Now, 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate, again, is given IM, um, greater influence, progesterone given IV, or given uh, uh, vaginally. Um, just a little follow-up on that. If you give that medication in the vagina, you're going to see it ascend and it will have what we call a first uterine pass effect as how it gets dosed and delivered to the tissues of the uterus and the cervix. So if we're thinking about safety, we're going to want to have, um, we're going to have to think about the idea of dose getting to where it needs to be. And we want to think about, uh, is, is there anything different between singletons and twins? Because I told you the amount of progesterone that's around is very different between those two groups. Um, we also need to think about 
the susceptibility for preterm birth in multiples is different than it is in singletons. Now, what are the rules of the game? We had, we had our grade criteria in how to assess the quality of evidence to say something works and there's efficacy that's there. Is that, are those similar rules and how we think about it the same for safety? Well, the answer is no. So we come to our second hero of the day. Our second hero um, was the individual that created the construct for how we should think about safety. Um, Sir Austin Bradford Hill was a World War I fighter. Um, he acquired TB during World War I after he was shot down. Spent a couple of years in the sanitarium. Um, remarkably, this is the individual who was responsible for the first randomized trial in medicine. And, not surprisingly, given his history, he studied whether streptomycin was going to be efficacious in this condition called tuberculosis that he had been afflicted with. If that's not enough to be the person that's responsible for the first randomized clinical trial in medicine, he and Sir Richard Dahl were the first to figure out that if you smoke, you can have lung cancer. And that smoking, actually, compared to all the advertisements, isn't always good for you. That was not always the assumption. We had to, there had to be someone that, that took on the world and understood that there can be risks that come from this particular activity. And we know the extensive amount of morbidity and mortality that has come from cigarette smoking. So here is Sir Austin Bradford Hill's criteria to look at causation and that what the body of evidence should show us to try to look for um, whether or not something causes, ca whether or not this exposure causes the harm that you're wanting to look at. And so the first one is the strength of the association. If you have a significantly higher difference between control groups and exposed groups, then you're going to be more worried that that causes harm. How consistent do you see the observation in a variety of different studies in different locations and by different um, examiners and investigators? Is there specificity? We'll talk about the importance of specificity. Is the exposure always happening before the outcome? Is there a dose response, experimental evidence, plausible, uh, biologic plausibility, coherence, and analogy? In summary, because we don't do trials to try to figure out whether something is safe, you have to put a whole body of evidence together to see whether you're causing harm or not. It's not just one particular result of one particular trial. Now, if you want to look at how, whether something is safe with progesterone and progestogens and 17-hydroxyprogesterone caprate and progesterone, you would look to see where the largest body of evidence is to try to look at that. And that is the trials that have been done in multiples exposure to 17-hydroxyprogesterone caprate. There are more of those trials, and because Rare bad things are rare. You need to look at a larger body, of, uh, larger body of evidence, a larger number of studies. So it's more likely to find a safety concern given the number of patients that are treated. And because twins are more likely to have complications and they're more susceptible to any kind of perturbation in the system, twins re require the reproductive system to be operating much more efficiently than they are for singletons due to the stresses that are placed on twins. There's, it's going to be more probable that we find um, a problem with an exposure just due to that susceptibility issue. So is there a difference in the frequency of adverse events with this synthetic progestogen, 17-hydroxy progesterone caprolate versus natural progesterone, and is that evidence in multiples? Fairly straightforward research question. Biologic plausibility. It would be helpful if the causation we suspect is plausible, but it is a feature I am convinced we cannot demand because what is biologically plausible depends upon the biological knowledge of the day. 
how much do we really understand pregnancy? And this, although 50 years later, is it prophetic for how we think about pregnancy today? Do we really understand when we give something and, and change this or change that of what's going on? And I would submit that although this is an incredibly elegant and important kind of picture to have in your mind about how progesterone interacts with progesterone receptors, we don't get to that kind of granularity when we're thinking about dosing with supplemental progesterone. This is supplemental progesterone, uh, this is progesterone caproate, and how this molecule with this kind of extra six carbons would interact with that progesterone receptor is probably not the same. And a matter of fact, if you look at studies, they're not the same. If this is how progesterone relates to progesterone receptor A and progesterone receptor B, and if progesterone's working and stimulating that receptor at 100% with a relative binding affinity, 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate is only at a quarter to a third of that no amount. It does not fit into that binding pocket as well as progesterone does. It's not the same. If you're needing to operate as efficiently as possible because twins demand that things operate as efficiently as possible and you by chance expose those twins to a drug that may not bind and work very well within that receptor there's a plausible process that you could actually cause harm rather than benefit When, when the MEAS trial data, the single trial that improves outcome with 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate, when they looked at different shapes of those receptors and different um, pharmacogenomic uh, data, they noted that some uh, of the uh, receptor genotypes were associated actually with, with almost a 13 to 16 increased odds for very early delivery in Caucasians. So there may be some subgroups where that's not very good. There's plausibility for this drug to actually cause harm rather than benefit. Strength. What's the, um, the quote from Sir Hill? Sir Hill um, told us that, uh, that the larger the magnitude of risk, the greater the, that we should pay attention to those risks. And I already told you that there was this, this potential of, of, of risk that exists this is not a very marked increase in risk for early pregnancy loss with 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate exposure. But there were five losses in the treatment group compared to zero in the placebo, something that we should pay attention to. However, in twins, in twins, when you had one study um, by Senate, when they did their study for delivery at less than 32 weeks, 29% of the twins that were given 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate delivered early at less than 32 weeks compared to only 8% of the controls. 29% versus 8%, a 2.4 um, increase in relative risk with a dramatic increase in, in p-value. The conclusion from these investigators was not to jump out and say, this causes harm, it was just to say that it didn't work. We may need to think about what the conclusion was. So we have to be ready, even with subtle increases in risk, to say that that risk is there and that the absence of benefit is not, uh, is not evidence for harm. How about consistency? Has the association seen by, by different people at different times? This is, a, this is a compilation of all the studies in, in, uh, in twins, except for the most recent study in twins. And if you look at all those studies in twins and look at each one, there in one by Dr. Rouse, there was a negative correlation between 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate exposure and gestational age at delivery. One showed a shorter duration of pregnancy. Another one, there was an uh, increase with babies that were exposed that were very small, less than 1,500 grams. Another study showed there were more babies that required oxygen and severe respiratory distress syndrome in those that were exposed to 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate. And in two, and in two studies, there was an increased risk of death when you treated multiples 
with 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate. Evidence for harm is not absence of benefit. Specificity, an extremely important concept. Specificity is what, what randomized clinical trials are trying to do. We hope that through randomness, fate, providence, flipping a coin, what have you, the two groups that we compare will have similar features and, and relatively little differences in what we call confounding, and that the intervention will be re primarily responsible for what we see, and therefore we can believe that the intervention was responsible for the change that's observed. Well, you can put all the data from all the twin studies together, and when you, when you give 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate, to a group of women that should be at low risk, those that have a cervical length of greater than 20, really long cervixes, or those women before things are occurring relatively early in pregnancy, unfortunately with a longer duration of exposure potentially if you give it earlier in pregnancy, but both of these subgroups, both of these subgroups, there was harm associated with the, with the administration of the drug. We know that we're giving the drug before we look at pregnancy outcomes, so temporality is true. How about biologic gradient? Can we find anything that, that tells us about dose response? Higher the exposure, greater the risk. More you smoke, the more probable it is that you get lung cancer. If you look at the serum concentration of 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate and it increases the duration of pregnancy in the gestational age at delivery decreases. The more that's in the mom's serum, the greater the risk for the pregnancy to continue. Perhaps the greater the competition with the native progesterone that's around for those progesterone receptors. Coherence is what we're saying. Does it conflict with other natural histories of disease? The answer is yes. We've had our DES story that shows that we can, we can alter hormonal symptom, systems and, and cause problems. How about experimental data? Is there something in the lab that can give us a hint? I showed you this morning that if you give progesterone, you can quiet a uterus down. And we all love not to see a uterus contract as much. What happens if you take a piece of muscle from the uterus at the time of a C-section and, and put it in a little tissue bath and and put some 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate next to it. Well, instead of the uterus going quiet and not contracting, you put 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate in it, and it starts to spasm. That's concerning. We did a large study that said, remember those days of uterine, home uterine activity monitoring, where we put hundreds of thousands of hours and had women be before they got their dose of 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate, they were monitored, they were monitored the day after their dose. What happened to their contraction frequency? How much did their uterus work before and after the dose? Well, it turns out that their uterus was contracting just like the little twitches that you saw in the experiment, and they had a significant increase in the frequency of contractions with a p-value of less than 0.03. Analogy, kind of poetic for, for 1965, with the effects of thalidomide and rubella before us, we would surely be ready to accept slighter but similar evidence of another drug or another viral disease in pregnancy. I don't know whether that's true. How many, how many times have you heard, don't give 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate in twins? Because it causes harm. Maybe not so much. Should we be that, should we be a little bit more aggressive? So in my grade of what happens, there is a remarkable amount of evidence and consistency and the criteria of Sir Austin Bradford Hill are, are, are satisfied to say that 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate is actually contraindicated in twin gestations as a prophylactic or therapeutic agent. Don't give the medicine. That's different than our experience with natural progesterone, particularly natural progesterone in multiples. There's been no increase in adverse events 
with that exposure in singletons uh, or twins. How about some of the other populations that, in which we could potentially find harm? I made a little bit of a reference to symptomatic patients earlier today. If you look at a mouse model, and you have a model for preterm birth with a mouse, um, and you give um, a progestogen, you actually increase um, mortality and increase the rates of earlier delivery, which was shown by Dr. Elevitz. There was the one human trial in symptomatic patients that had a short cervix and that were given vaginal progesterone. And again, I told you that these two curves were concerning for some earlier deliveries. So symptomatic patients, we don't know enough. We don't know enough to say, do we treat the 28-weeker that had, comes in with contractions or the 30-weeker? I alluded to that question a little bit this morning. But don't treat symptomatic patients with vaginal progesterone as of 2016. Safety concerns with exposure in symptomatic women, as, uh, as we alluded to in that trial, for delivery less than 34 weeks, there was a significant increase in symptomatic patients that were given progesterone. And, and that's our one study in this population. But it's enough for me to say, be careful. It may not be the same thing as asymptomatic patients. Now, we talked about what's developing between 16 and 20 weeks, and that's the brain. And we said, how do we know whether the brain's developing normally? Well, that's a very important. We know that there's exposure and prolonged exposure of 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate into the fetus. And we know that that exposure even lasts for roughly six weeks after the time of birth. And we know the brain's doing remarkable developing during that interval. And we know that there are progesterone receptors in the brain. They happen to be at certain important, the prelimbic medial prefrontal cortex. And those are the areas that, that may be related to um, behavioral teratogenicity, autism spectrum disorders, hyperreactivity, and even anxiety. What about back to animal work? If you expose 17 hydroxyprogesterone caproate to animals, and you look at the, br the growth of the brain and differentiation of the brain, there's a significant difference in what you see between those that you give saline to and those that you, see you give 17 hydroxyprogesterone caproate to. And if you put those animals into a maze and see if they behave the same when they get, they get a con, uh, they've been given control versus whether they were exposed to 17 hydroxyprogesterone caproate, unfortunately, those that were given the drug had a higher or had less cognitive flexibility. They couldn't learn. They preserved um, old, bad uh, strategies to try to get their treats instead of learning new things and expanding their, their ability to um, take in new information from the environment. How many studies have we had in, in humans with exposure that addresses some of these kinds of issues? And the answer is not much. Insufficient data for long-term outcomes when we have these kinds of perturbations in how CNS development could be uh, occurring and that's what we call behavioral teratogenicity. Again, something that may take decades after exposures for us to figure out. So my summary is that 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate is not natural progesterone, and that there is sufficient evidence for adverse outcomes in multiples so that it's contraindicated. Evidence for harm is not the same as absence of benefit, and further research is needed, especially for long-term outcomes to demonstrate safety. So we have our first intervention that's been shown to alter the rate of early preterm birth. We have the first time that we have the best evidence to show that we can alter preterm birth, but we have an awesome responsibility to demonstrate that that is safe. And it will require diligence, and it, the story as it frequently is with safety, is not over. We want to minimize and 
treat appropriate patients, not overgeneralize, and treat lots and lots of people um, that may not benefit from the intervention. And that's because almost everything can have some concerns for safety. And we have to take that, given our history in obstetrics, take that extraordinarily seriously. So I think with that somber note, it's time to, uh, to finish up today's events. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, Dave's, I don't see him in eyeshot, but uh, he probably had.